All right. So how do the chapter and state components and the National Association benefit from working as partners? Um, well, I, you know, I thought about this for a little bit and basically um, it's, I think it's a two way street and I think it's a win win situation. Uh, the chapters um, and, you know, at the state level, they provide services for the local individuals that's much easier for uh, an individual at the chapter level to express their needs, whatever they may be in terms of the profession and so on. And so the chapter is the agency that can uh, hopefully address those needs. They're in tune with them and they can address those needs. But then you need some, sometimes you need some massive resources and that's where the national comes in. That's where the association level comes in. Um, for example, we have, uh, that's, the, that's one of the reasons why our headquarters are right outside of DC. The headquarters for a while used to be in New York City and then they moved them. It was a short period of time, but they decided to move to New York City because that's the heart of the, the seat of the government. I don't need to tell you how critical that is right now um, and, and the, the magnet that it's, that it's, uh, that it's created. But that's, that's where the federal laws are enacted. And we wanna be sure that we, um, uh, uh, that we promote and support legislation that supports not, not us, but the patients and clients that we treat. So that, that's, the, that's the power of the national level right there, um, as well as providing consistency, uh, standards of practice, uh, assistance in guidance and education, uh, um, accreditation and things of that nature. So at the national level, you have an opportunity to, pro to pro uh, provide consistency across the board for all of us. But at the chapter level, you get much more at the local level. You know, it's sort of a state's rights issue because, um, you know, the way we, the kinds of things that are important in Alaska may be quite different from the kinds of things that are important in Hawaii. The kinds of uh, the situations that the common conditions that you might see, Florida, uh, there's, a, there's a, hard, a large proportion of retired individuals there in Florida. So the kind of therapy that's more common in Florida might be quite different than the kind of therapy that's, that's in Montana, where you might have ranchers and you know, the kinds of conditions that might, might appear there. So at the chapter level, it gives you the opportunity to provide the services and meet the needs of a much more local population both the therapists and the patients and clients that we treat. So I really think it's a win-win situation. Perfect. Um, and then before we go any further, do you wanna tell us about your journey in the APTA, including work with chapter, reference committee, and house of delegates? Yeah, that's the first question I saw on the list here. Yeah. So I, I thought of you, are you gonna skip that? And I realized, you know, I've been a member for over 50 years. So we, we, uh, we, we can spend a long time on this, but I'll give you the short version. I was very fortunate to have spent most of my professional years in the two largest chapters of this organization. Born and bred in New York, I went to school at University of Buffalo, graduated from Buffalo, but that was during the height of the Vietnam War, 1969. So either I was gonna be, I had my draft notice. So either I was gonna be drafted into the army and it, your education matters not. So I applied for a direct commission, in which case I was able to practice as a physical therapist. So my first job was really in the, in the army. And it was wonderful because we were doing direct access then, and which is still, we were able to order imaging. We were able to order x-rays. We couldn't read them, but we could order them. That's 50 years ago. Yeah. But my, my first job was really, um, my jobs really took me to California. Um, I, I, I applied for a master's degree program there was a two-year master's, but it required clinical practice. And that's where I began, began to get involved uh, with the APTA. I should backtrack a bit. My first involvement was in New York as a student. I went to the chapter annual conference. New York has tremendous leaders. Marilyn Moffitt, uh, who is an icon in our profession, uh, a past president of the APTA, past president of the World Confederation of APTA, of, of, of uh, World Confederation of Physical Therapy, other leaders like that in New York State. So I went to the annual conference as a student and I was hooked. So that, that really got me hooked to uh, re, uh, maintain my membership in the organization. I, I actually became involved when I was out in California. I was in, uh, practicing in San Francisco. I became involved with the district, the education committee. I got involved with the board of directors. 
Um, they nominated me to be a member of the education committee at the national level. So that started my involvement at the national level. Then I moved back to New York. My family was back in New York. I always felt a, a, a pull to get back there. And I, and I, I once again, I became involved locally. It was, it was upstate New York. It was at a local district, um, became a, um, the, the chair of the district. Then I moved up to the board of directors. Um, I was on the, I was a treasurer there. My most, of all my involvement with the, with the APTA, my position in, in the New York chapter as the speaker of the delegate assembly was my most enjoyable. That's like a mini house of delegates. And uh, as the speaker, you preside over that. I really thoroughly enjoyed that to moderate and listen to all the arguments, whether I agreed or not, I could not say that. I had to maintain a position of neutrality. And then I became a governance junkie. I really like governance in the APTA. So I, I, um, I applied to be a member of the reference committee at the national level and I was accepted. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed trying to help people move from a concept to a motion. Regar again, regardless whether I agreed or disagreed, my job was to help you create a motion that's in order, well-worded, and then let the body decide. Let the delegate, let the, the House of Delegates, over 400 voting members, let them decide. Um, and then I served the three-year term. And then there was a mass exodus of the members of the committee because one person uh, ran for the, uh, the Speaker of the House of Delegates and she won. Other members, their terms have expired. I was asked if I would come back on the committee and I agreed, it was not in my game plan, but I agreed to do that. So I served two terms on the reference committee, thoroughly enjoyed those, those experiences. Then I moved to, to Oregon uh, because our two sons here moved here and we were very fortunate that they both moved to Portland, Oregon. So my wife and I, my wife is also a physical therapist. So we moved here and I became involved with the delegation here. Um, I just completed uh, three one-year terms as the chief delegate and um, thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, very innovative group of, of individuals here, uh, fairly young, but very innovative, very energetic, uh, quite different from the New York chapter or the California chapter. This is much smaller, obviously, mm -hmm. but very creative people, very much engaged. So it's been a, it's been a, it's been a wonderful experience for me, uh, uh, all of my years or decades of experience in the professional organization. Um, you know, I, it's it's uh, it's a no-brainer for me to maintain my membership. So it's it's been a delight. Awesome! I can't believe how many people you've probably met and connections you've made too through all those years. I have met a bunch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I've been th you know it's I'm at the age now where you you pick up. I in fact just this week I heard of a, of an, one, another one of the icons who have passed away. Hmm. Some of, sort of my generation is is moving into that into that age level now where we're moving on so yeah. that's kind of sad but yeah. uh, but yes I have made I have I've had the good fortune to meet a lot of people yes mm -hmm. yes awesome thank you for that mm -hmm. and then um, what has the APATA provided for you your patients your students and the profession I, I think two things um, primarily resources uh, to me as a professional uh, I get tremendous amount of information and opportunities, learning opportunities, um, but, uh, but resources from the APTA, but also representation. You know, we spoke, I spoke a little bit about how important our professional organization is to represent our interests, not just our interests, but the best interests of society um, in terms of uh, policies, procedures, regulations, and legislation that happens at the national level. So um, I think it, it's been helpful for all of us, members, as well as the patients and clients that we treat to have that, um, uh, that, that those professional aspirations, the standards and so on that are promoted by our organization. And it helps all of us, we as providers, but also patients and clients as, as recipients. Um, and, it, and of course it helps the profession. You know, I've been around here long enough that in my early years, we were not well, we were not considered a profession. We were still considered sort of technical individuals. That's, that's in the past. And we, and we, and we, had, we had to fight that for recognition. That is um, 
uh, for good reason now, that's in the past. We, we never have to feel defensive about being recognized as a profession. So just, uh, just on the TV this past week, I heard a, a, an episode of an individual saying, oh yeah, my physical therapist is doing blah, blah, blah. You know, it was a TV episode of something. I, I don't know what it was, but hey, we made national attention now when we, when we make the, the, you know, sort of the sitcoms and so on. But yes, we are, rec we are recognized by society, but also by healthcare prof uh, professionals as a profession and well-respected for, for the kind of um, services that we provide. Um, I think it's also provided uh, leadership and standards. For example, uh, we have standards of practice that we have uh, fostered and enacted as a profession. But this gets back to the difference between the states and the national level. Okay, we have standards. Those are not laws. So at the state level, you have um, uh, practice laws, um, uh, laws that, that guide your practice. And so they, those laws might be quite, quite different. So we, we sort of have a model. This, this is what we, your, the law should say for you to be able to do as a physical therapist. But, it, but the, each state has a, what's called a state practice act. That could differ. So uh, in, I'm, in, I'm in, you know, I'm, we are, I'm, I'm in Portland, right across the river is Vancouver, Washington. And what's legal in the state of Oregon might not be legal in the state of Washington. So we, we need to be very much aware of that and make sure that we are practicing within the boundaries of the practice act of our jurisdiction, of where, where we are licensed, where we are licensed to practice. So it provides sort of models and standards for all of us for practice. Um, you know, there, uh, there are three legs to our profession, practice, education, and research. And I think the, 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 um, the APTA provides resources in all three of those areas. Um, you go to the website, which has recently been completely redesigned more for the public than for members, but that serves as, as, a, as a resource for, for individuals. But um, you know, we have the Foundation for Physical Therapy. That's probably maybe 30 years old and that supports research in physical therapy. Once again, going back decades, we were not real recognized because we were not doing bona fide clinical research. Again, that's in the past. We now have evidence-based practice. So our practice is based upon research that we are doing. We're not borrowing it from others. We are doing those well-funded, federally funded grant research projects and coming up with sound data that now guide our practice. So, I think the APK is providing a great deal of resources for us in all three areas, practice, education, and research. You know, we have technically the accrediting body, the Commission on Accreditation of Physical Therapy Education has to be separate from the APTA so that it's not self-serving, but it's a close relationship. And um, that provides a lot, I can't say technically that that's being provided by the APTA, but there is a close relationship. And we certainly uh, use that guidance and I, it's more than guidance. Uh, it's, um, the, those are standards that, that every educational program, those are minimal standards that every educational program must satisfy in order to be accredited. Those are the kinds of things, once again, for consistency and standards that are provided at the national level. Awesome. And then let's see, what do you say to someone who's thinking about becoming involved and doesn't know where to begin? I'd say start local. Start local, you know, at your school, for example, for yourself, start at your school level. Uh, uh, again, Oregon has a very nice um, organizational structure for students to get involved. Uh, you have liaisons with each of the programs, and there are several more physical therapist education programs that are in the stage of development that look quite certain that they will be taking students in the near future. And so I know now, now we have only two, but, but in the next couple of years, that, you know, that's gonna double to as many as five, <coughs> excuse me. So it's great to start at that level to become involved. Um, we don't have districts in, this, in the state because it's, it, uh, there's not enough um, you know, people and, and density of di various densities of population, um, but we have a wonderful opportunity. Again, I'm gonna go back to governance. There's an, an Emerging Student Leader Award. And I was delighted to see that within Oregon. 
uh, one physical therapist and one physical therapist assistant education student is um, is awarded that you know you have to apply, but we have an opportunity to provide one award for one PT and one SPTA each year. And what they do is they become full members of the delegation from Oregon that goes to the House of Delegates. Every, they do everything that a delegate does except vote. <clears throat> they follow motions, they interview candidates and so on. That's a wonderful learning opportunity for a student to learn about governance in the APTA and then become more involved later on. We are allocated seven delegates for, for Oregon. Virtually half of them are past recipients of that, that award. So that's, that's an example of how a, a, a professional development opportunity really is well used and really helps the student to become involved, you know, student and eventual delegate to become involved. Um, so, hi. Um, I, you know, I'd start local as, you know, I did. Um, I, I started local and I went up to the, uh, the state level and then, you know, and then at the national level. But it's not something that you should feel forced to do. It's, it's something that you should feel excited about doing. And then it's not work, it's, it's uh, an effort of joy. Uh, and you feel very rewarded. It's just like when you're treating your patient. Sometimes there, it's very difficult and very tough. I'm, I remember I recalled several patients that I've dealt with that were very difficult, uh, typically, um, a patient who had serious third degree burns and it was very painful to do the uh, exercises and so on. At the point of discharge, the individual was in tears thanking me for the services that I provided, knowing that if I had not done that, the individual would have been you know, permanently contracted and so on, or have, have had to have uh, surgery to remove scars and contractures. But sometimes it's very difficult, but re very rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that's an example of how sometimes the, um, the work that you're doing um, is, is, is uh, extensive, but you feel um, gratified when you, when you see the results of your efforts. Yeah. Awesome. I liked that connection to the patients too. Um, well, here's one, one other suggestion okay. um, to get involved. Uh, attend the combined sections meeting. That, again, I'm going to go back decades. That used to be a small meeting and the annual conference, which was in June, was the big meeting of, of the APTA. That's flipped. We're, we're, at, the, we're at, the, um, uh, at, the, at the juncture of actually having no more annual conference. It's now called the next conference, NEXT. It's very small. Combined sections meeting now exceeds 15,000 people. That's huge. It's, it's so large that we have a limited number of cities where we can hold the meeting because of uh, accommodations. The, the electricity and the excitement and the networking that happens at that particular meeting is, um, is, a, is overwhelming. Unfortunately, this year, it's gonna be all virtual, mm -hmm. unprecedented. We've never had that, oppor uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that opportunity before or, or that uh, condition before, mm -hmm. but, that's another, another example of, you go to one of those meetings and boy, you feel the electricity and there's a lot going on specifically for students or young professionals. And, and that's another way of getting involved. Oh, and one, other, one other suggestion is to you know, find your niche, find your area of, of interest and join a section. The, the, the titles of the sections are now switching over to academies. Uh, and they're one and the same. It's the same structure, but it's just titling the, the, the organizational unit differently. That's your area of, of, of clinical practice uh, primarily, or it could be, an, uh, could be laws and regulations or things of that nature or, or of administration or education. But the, your area of personal interest in, in, in your profession, I would join a section. And that's another area where you find your network and, and you get more um, excited about your, your uh, profession. Perfect. All right, and then the last one, where would you like to see our profession go over the next 100 years? That's a tough one. Boy, I tell you, uh, I wish I had a crystal ball. I, you know, my wife is a physical therapist and I shared that question with her as well. And, and we both we kind, of, both kind of shook our heads. <laughs> um, I like the, 
um, direction that we have gone and are continuing to go. Again, I've been around here for 50 years, so I've seen a dramatic uh, change in all three areas of our three-legged stool, practice, education, and research. I would like to see uh, our practice to continue to grow and expand, um, expand the opportunities that we have to, to, to provide diagnostic examinations as well as interventions. Um, you know, like I said, 50 years ago, I was doing um, ordering x-rays uh, because that was legal within the military. It's not yet legal in our profession, but we're, get, we're getting real close to that. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're getting more recognized to be, as diagnosticians uh, and then to design a, a, um, a course of, uh, of intervention, a plan of care for the individual. So um, I think that we continue, we should continue to provide evidence and practice, evidence-based practice. That's going to require good research. When I look at our education, I think we're just about at the pinnacle for physical therapists. I don't think we can go much higher than the doctorate of physical therapy. I do think that, it's, we're, that the education for the physical therapist assistant is going to evolve probably within the next couple of years to the baccalaureate degree. I know there are mixed feelings about that, but I think, um, I think we're, we are coming to the point where the majority of individuals are going to think that's in the best interest of, of the education for the physical therapist assistant. When I look at technology and how it's exploding, I think that's gonna have a dramatic impact on our uh, diagnostic techniques and our treat, on our intervention techniques. Um, when I, you know, when, uh, when I look at the kinds of uh, bioengineering that's happening in, for example, individuals who have had complete spinal cord injuries and are, you know, have uh, flaccid paralysis in the, in the low extremities and are, you know, now um, not functionally, but because with, with, through biomechanics can ambulate, you know, a hundred years from now, they're probably gonna be walking. Uh, mm -hmm with uh, bioengineering apparatus. Um, we might have implants, brain implants that can turn areas of the brain on, turn areas of the brain off to, to control spasticity and provide functional movement. Um, we have tel telehealth right now, where through using this kind of medium, we can do some modicum of examination and sort of interventions through advice. Probably a hundred years from now, I'm going to be able to touch you mechanically through technology. I, I don't, you know, I can't envision that now. There, there are some, there, there are some surgeries that are being done through telehealth. Um, pretty crazy, but it is happening. So I, it, it's hard to imagine where we're going to go with technology, but but I know it's just going to explode in the future. I was having a conversation with my grandson the other day about air flight. He wanted to do away with fossil fuels and he's only nine. <laughs> I said, no, there was, an, ex there, there was a, a, an experimental plane that flew around the world. Now this was not just a matter of hours, it was a matter of, of weeks on solar power. So exclusively solar power, only, only, only one individual, just a pilot. Uh, and I thought, you know, a hundred years ago, we had the first flight, the Kitty Hawk. And, and here, you know, we, we're, at, we're now on the verge of sending people to Mars. So, you know, look at where we've been over the past hundred years. I can't, I can't really, I truly can't imagine where we're going to be hundred years from now, but where would I want us to be? I want us to be contemporary, um, current in our, what, what, whatever's going on at the time, uh, continuing to provide, uh, you know, excellent care for individuals who need it, uh, according to whatever measures are going to be uh, a common at the time. And again, I, I can't even imagine those because I think technology is going to have a huge impact on our diagnostic, our examination, on our intervention techniques. So um, that's probably my, my thoughts. <laughs> awesome. I think that's a good answer. Yeah. All right, so that is all of our questions. Um, I will, I'll just thank you for your time and then I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Okay.